everyone. That was like a TV show that voice came from. I don't even know where was that from. So we're not done yet. All right, so keep the questions coming through on Twitter. Keep the chat coming through. I'm enjoying looking at it while I'm sitting over here in my corner that they've put me in now. Uh, we obviously are going to be taking questions from the, the people here in the audience. So I'm super excited for our next presenter. He's presented for us before. He always does an amazing job. And he's worked on some great, great work because he works at Marvel. So we're all fans of that, I'm sure, pretty much everyone. So I'm going to let him take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Herman. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, my name is Josh Herman. Uh, I work at Marvel Studios. Um, recently, Guardians of the Galaxy came out. It did? <laughs> yeah, it's big. Maybe you heard of it. Um, anyways, I worked on Guardians of the Galaxy. That was probably one of the most recent ones that's definitely come out. Um, but just to give you guys a little bit more about who I am and kind of the other work that I've I've done, I tend to do a lot of the models for our group. So I work in the visual development uh, group for Marvel. We oversee all the, pretty much all the MCU movies. Uh, so I model and sculpt and design for that. I'm the only 3D person there. I'm the only person who does anything with ZBrush, anything with modeling, really. So if it's a CG character, if it's Iron Man, Iron Patriot, War Machine, uh, Groot, Rocket, the Hulk, um, you know, pretty much anything that's a CG character, I'm involved in it, and yeah, it's awesome. So um, these are going to cycle through. The, these ones are pretty straightforward from Iron Man 3. Um, this is from the Avengers. I, before I worked at Marvel, I worked at Legacy Effects. That was my first job out of school. Uh, I actually graduated from Noman School of Visual Effects, so represent. Um, but Legacy Effects is a practical, they're a practical effects house, right? They do makeups and costumes and props and things like that. So they did a lot of the Iron Man models on a, you know, Iron Man 1 and 2 and Avengers. And uh, you can see this is the model that I had done. And we would actually paint, paint, paint it and then print it, reverse that order. But that's what we did uh, for the movie. So we would make practical maquettes for the movie and uh, then you can put it on set and you can see you know, what it's going to look like and you can use it as a lighting reference and you can also sell it as a toy like this which was sold as a toy later. So we did this for the movie. Um, this is for Real Steel also from Legacy Effects. So we printed these out and these ended up being about eight and a half foot tall hydraulic robot puppets uh, for Hugh Jackman to play with. Also from Real Steel. Uh, Total Recall, so doing the, the synths. Also getting to do a little bit of chance of design. When you come in early, when you work in pre-production, um, which a lot of you know, makeup and stuff is in pre-production, you're getting a script and you're getting a brief and you're getting a rough idea sometimes of what it is. They're not, they're not totally sure what it is. Um, when you get in that order, in that early, sometimes you get to put your hands in it and say like, well, what do you guys think about this? Or you get to try something. So, and here we were really, really early and I was trying out some other things for the helmet, throwing back to, um, you know, kind of the, the total recall from the 80s with like the weird you know, VHS kind of lines on the screens. Uh, after I left Legacy, I went to Naughty Dog and I worked at Naughty Dog for about six to, six to eight months on Uncharted 3. Um, mostly just through crunch, which was fun. I had a lot of work, but really fun. And I did a lot of the background characters in the NPC and the multiplayer characters for Uncharted. But the one main character that I did get a focus on is this guy, and this is Salim, the Bedouin leader uh, from Uncharted. And I think the rest of this will just be some kind of random personal work. Uh, this is for Essence Creatures, which is a book that came out uh, whenever Seagraph was. So is that a year ago? A year ago today, uh, this was coming out. Um, and this is showing in the book some of the process of how I would start with a rough sculpt, my rough idea. And I tend to work um, evolutionarily, if that's a word. Um, basically, I, I tend to start with one idea and I will kind of 
follow it till its end. It doesn't always stay on the same track. I don't necessarily have a final idea for what I want my design to be with. But as it kind of gets there, I will try out different ideas and kind of go down these branches. Um, and that's kind of what this was. So initially, you could see it had you know, more of a head, but the basic idea is kind of there throughout the iterations of the sculpt. And then I would also do a, like a beauty render of it to kind of show and paint over on top of it to kind of show what it looks like. Uh, more legacy work, doing some, some halo helmets for commercials. Uh, creature work, just for fun, I think. I think actually, this was for a class. This is actually done at Noman uh, for a short. Uh, also some old, you know, Noman school work here. Um, some more legacy work, doing some creature design and, you know, early briefs, some fan art, Super Meat Boy, if anybody's played that game. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And I think this is the last one. Cool. So that's basically my work, uh, you know, kind of my, my current resume. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit, I wanted to go over two projects today for you guys. So first I wanted to go over uh, a piece that I did for the Comic-Con contest that was last, you know, several months ago, I think at the beginning of the year. Uh, and I ended up doing uh, a Silver Surfer piece. So that was the character that I chose. Um, and I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit today going through the, the process and kind of the pipeline that I used to get to the design because I got through there entirely through ZBrush. There was no, there was no sketching, there was no anything, just straight into 3D. Um, so I, when I redesigned him, you know, I wanted, he's a character who had never really been redesigned. He's always a naked silver guy. Um, and that's really it. You know, maybe he'll get bigger eyes, maybe he'll have a different planar cheekbone, but really he's kind of the same the whole time. So what I would do, uh, and I'll go over this in a second, but just so you can see the quick overview, is I would take a render something like this, which this is uh, sculpted in ZBrush, and then I would render it out in Keyshot, and I would um, paint over it to look something like this. I wanted to try having a two-tone feel. Uh, I didn't want him to feel straight up silver because that's too, too close, I want to change it just a little bit and you can get away with a lot by just adding in a second color. Um, and then I would go over that and do a, a, a mood image. You know, this is, they didn't spend as much time on it, but it's kind of the gist of the character, you know, a possible option for the character. And after going through all of this, I would do a full paint to see if I like the two-tone. So I would go over the whole thing in ZBrush and this is actually just, um, just black and white. So I'm painting just in black and white to try to get the two-tone feel of it down. And then I would render that out in Keyshot and say like, do I like the way that this is looking? And then the final, this is one of the final presentation shots right here. Because you had to show a front and a back of the character. And then I ended up doing a full color version, which is what you saw first. And then just for fun, to kind of go back to the classic comic look where he was really, really, really chrome, I liked. And I did a black and white version. So to show you how that all kind of works, I'll just hop in here and show you some of the, the working files and a little bit of how I got there. So the very, very first thing I did was I just blocked out some basic human proportions. Uh, and what I was doing was I was thinking about the character. Uh, who is the character? What kind of the guy is he? Aside, you know, how, how far can you go with a naked silver guy, right? All, if he's essentially a naked buff guy, um, what else can you add into that? I wanted to, you know, maybe, maybe put in some mechanical bits and try to think of who the essence of the character is. So to me, he's very... Um, Elegant, he's kind of morally ambiguous. He doesn't necessarily have, you know, 
he, when he's first introduced at least, he doesn't have a very uh, clear moral compass. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? And for me, that means that first, first thing when you first see him, you can't tell if he's a good guy or if he's a bad guy. He's not wearing stars and stripes, right? He's, he's, he's could be good, but he's also kind of cool looking and he's also approachable. Uh, so that was one thing I really wanted to look into. And what I started to, to look at was maybe you just take the character and you really, really planarize him and maybe try to make some flow lines and some really elegant curves go throughout him. Um, so I started looking at Art Deco, which is kind of you know, a very simple but echoing shapes and, a, and an elegant design pattern. So I took this and uh, I started sculpting on it. And this is the first iteration of it. And I wanted to show you guys one of my techniques that I've developed for sculpting both helmets and characters that need to be in armor, but also just for sculpting characters like this to create unique shapes. So what I actually did, and I'll, I'll, I have a hotkey for solo mode um, just to show you, but this is actually, this is two subtools. And essentially what they are, oh, it's actually three subtools, but um, each one of them is a different part of the body, but they all started from the same body. So if I just cycle through them, you can see like they're all kind of jacked up if you look at them individually, right? Uh, but the bottom one, is, which is more or less this is, is kind of what we're, we're looking at. So how, the way I like to use this is I'll take, I'll just hide all these other ones. I'll, I'll take an initial body sculpt like this and I'll duplicate it. And then what I'll do is I'll take this and I'll deflate it by one or two. So it's negative two actually. So that's now fully inside the other body. And then what I can do is I can use brushes like the clay buildup brush or any, really any brush, and I can start sculpting through. And what this does is it gives me like, it's geometry wherever I want it in the shape where I, I need it. So it's not gonna be somewhere out on, you know, on the sides of his head or something where I don't need it. But if I wanna start sculpting like a helmet or different you know, shapes that can come through, I can quickly define, you know, oh, like I want this to kind of stick through here and, you know, maybe he's got a big, some, you know, bridge and a cap and start just kind of carving out. This is like the real steel robot or something. But, you know, you can quickly get shapes, be like, oh, like I like that. Or if you don't like it, you just push it back inside. And we'll give him like a George Washington wig, right? And I like a, like, um, let's see if we can get something else. Yeah. Well, he's got a goatee and a, a wig, so that's good enough. Um, but the way I really like to use it is I can quickly start trying to get interesting shapes with it. We'll just hide that because they're a little distracting. But um, I can take this whole arm, for example, I'll show them both, and I can really start pushing this line and I can start defining where I want this crease to be. So for this character where I knew there had to be a sense of flow throughout the body, I could easily start drawing on without having to poly paint, without having to do, you know, an additional step, I could do it through form and I could still see the two-tone that I was eventually wanting to get. So I can push through this and try to get some shapes that are kind of, you know, elegant and interesting. even if it's just a simple kind of bodysuit. And the thing I quickly learned trying to do something like this was if you don't, if, it does, if it's not there, it doesn't look good. Like when you're trying to make a smooth, elegant form, it's like cutting the middle out of a Ferrari. Like you have the front and the back and the middle is just like, doesn't make it work, right? It's a, it's a really painful process. So going through it and doing a lot of iterations to try to find you know, interesting creative shapes um, was both fun, but I, I definitely learned a lot during the, the design phase. So the next thing that I eventually did, and you can kind of see I already had a, a um, oh, 
all right. It's also good for creature design. Um, is I took all the ones that were visible and I just dynameshed them all together. So I, everything that was visible, visible, I went to merge, merge visible, and now this is its own, its own sub tool, its own Z tool, and I can just dynamesh that whole thing together. So jumping up to the next progress, you can see I spent a little bit more time, I went a little bit more planar, had no idea what I wanted to do with his face. Uh, how do you do a planar face that's really smooth and elegant you know, can that tie in with the rest of the body or should I try something more extreme, you know, a blank face or a visor or a totally robotic face, you know, a one lens, unilens, things. Tried a bunch of different things. Um, and just kind of slowly progressing here. Uh, and the main tools that I use for this is mostly the, the damn standard brush, the trim dynamic brush, and the H polish. So all of those I use a lot, and then as well as the move, just standard move brush to kind of move some of those shapes around. So for example, if I wanted to trim some of this right here, I would take the trim dynamic brush, and I would just kind of start reorganizing or re, you know, just changing the plane of this. And then I would take the H polish brush, and I would kind of run that across the surface. And what I do is I, I learned this technique from somebody else, but I make really small circles as I go across it. Because if I go over it, it can kind of create its own planes. But if I go gently and make really small circles, it'll kind of smooth it out a little bit. And you can also use it in Alt to build up any of those divots that it's creating. And then finally, I'll just run over it real fast with a smooth brush at the end. And then I'll use the damn standard brush to kind of, once I've defined those lines, maybe I'll want to, you know, resketch a line, something that'll run through here, and maybe pop it out using Alt. To figure out where I want those new planes to be. And this will tend to create a little ridge here, and I'll use the H polish brush in in the negative using alt to kind of fill up to that ledge or you can use the trim dynamic brush as well it's very good at that and once that little divot is filled I'll kind of go back over it again with trim polish or trim or, or H polish so once I had this kind of iteration done I went to a another one let's see Looks like this one. So this is the near final initial ZBrush sculpt. So after I had kind of taken everything and, and uh, gotten at least the, the major design keys in, uh, this is what I took and I had rendered to make this or also this. Actually, just this. So I went into KeyShot and I rendered it and I wanted to play with you know, color and reflectivity and just kind of figure out what I was doing. And once I liked where I was going, I could move on to the kind of going into, I, I actually retopologized the whole thing in Maya and moved on from there to, to kind of figure out where my, where my process was going, what I really wanted it to look like. Like this is a, it's a solid enough model to get the idea across and be good enough for a paint over, you know, or, or for a concept I could probably just be done. But, when you've got to make a full model that you, could, you, know, you can really show off, you've got to continue. So uh, I went in and I re the whole thing, which I think is this one. This one's a little heavier. So you can see these are all individual pieces. And you can see I figured out the face and I had, had done some details. But to figure those out, I had done an intermediary kind of render here where you can see, this is a little grainy, but I rendered it out in KeyShot and I just went over it and tried out the two-tone and was trying to figure out you know, what new lines I could introduce and where I could introduce those and, and how to keep the, the eye moving throughout the body, hopefully. And you know, there's always going to be places or areas that stick, but um, how to make it overall more what I wanted. 
And so this is the, this sculpt right here is the one that I just painted everything on to get that final two-tone look. But you can even see, you can even see down here kind of in the legs that I didn't finish the sculpt here. Like just being able to go in with near, like this is a retopologized piece. But I was coming in and saying, well, I still don't know what I want. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to just kind of sketch and say like, maybe there's like a little break line that kind of runs this whole piece. And there's a little more segmented things like there are in his shoulders or you know, there's some segmented pieces. I drew these in as well, you could see. Like these are just lines that are drawn in, but it gives me an idea to go back and it's a very back and forth process. And what's good about that is it makes it so that the, the design isn't design execution. It's all design and there's execution throughout. You're ex executing the whole time. Um, and the thing that I like doing, and we do this a lot at work, is I'll get a painting and sometimes it's just a front view or sometimes it's a keyframe. And they're like, well, we're busy. We're going to do a final design, but just get started because there's a lot of stuff to do. So I'll get started and I'll get as far along as I can. And, you know, then they'll also be coming over to, to see it and they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's a cool idea. Or I didn't think it would look like this, but I like that. Um, and so the design is very fluid. It's not, ju it's not always just here's the design and they give it to you. So it's nice to be able to keep that into the later stages. So yeah, that's pretty much the final character. Uh, but the other character that I wanted to show you guys and just some more technique things today uh, was I was one of the main designers for Groot uh, in Guardians of the Galaxy. So this is my final design for Groot. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is one of my, this is the final design. We went through a lot of iterations. Josh, wait, watch. Oh, such powers. <laughs> such it's skill. magical, right? <laughs> uh, so this is the final design. Uh, I don't have approval to show you guys all the previous iterations. Um, there are some more in the art book. Uh, so you can check that out. Uh, but this is the final design, and he's a really fun character to do. Uh, and this was, you know, I had, I had not really, I'd played around with some of the previous ZBrush features, but I'm pretty meat and potatoes, right? I'm going to use my six brushes, I'm going to Dynamesh because that's pretty cool, and I'm going to Z-Remesh because that's awesome. And, you know, but aside from that, I'm going to use, I, I actually do set up, and I'll show you just in ZBrush, my hotkeys are pretty much like... Uh, like you play Doom, like you play a shooter, right? I got six weapons. I got my, my number one, my number two, my number three, number four, five, and six. And that's really all I use. I've set up a few buttons over here. Sometimes I put my little light thing over here so I can move it. But for the, you know, for the most part, I'm just going to use that. But then, you know, we had to design Groot. And how do you design a tree character that doesn't look like a Lord of the Rings character, right? You don't want it to have too much of a face. You don't want it to you know, have a beard. You don't want it to be too anamorphic. Um, but then it also has to quickly register as tree or, or at least plant-like. So I tried out, and this was the first time I had ever used them, but they're amazing, is a lot of the curve brushes. So as you can see here, he's, he's full of roots and, and vines and, and things like that. And I'll show you a little bit of the process, but what I did was I sculpted a base form, like you kind of saw uh, with the, the silver surfer thing, and then I just started sketching on top of it. So I put a ton of curves and I just basically started sculpting individual roots and individual vines that would kind of go around him and make that up to uh, make that up. So this is a previous version, and you can see you know, a little bit more. These are just kind of straight up curved brushes. You can see it. Um, but all the way going throughout the body and just kind of using it to, using the curve brushes perfectly for, it just fit perfect for what I needed. So this is pre-haircut Groot. Um, and this is one of the early ones that I did that really, they liked the face a lot. They just wanted to kind of 
make it a little friendlier because he was coming off a little intense, a little moody. And so we ended up just going with that one. So the process that I use for that, and I'll show you guys, spend a little bit more time demoing with that, is I sculpted a base form. And we'll just use this as a form, and we'll just have fun with it and make something. How much time do I have, by the way? You got like 30 minutes. Perfect. Cool. So we'll quickly just rough up something that's a little more interesting. Subdivide one time. Uh, and for anybody who's wondering, I just, while Martin was um, doing his interview, I just sculpted this little base thing. So it's not, it's just a Dynamesh thing. Which I like to use Dynamesh a lot for, for creating things from scratch. You know, if I have to make a, a specific humanoid character or if it has to have specific proportions, then I'll go ahead and throw in a tool or maybe something like that. But for the most part, I'm all right with just starting in Dynamesh. Make like a angrier, bigger brother. So because this character is going to have so much stuff on him, we'll, we'll, um, I'm not going to worry about symmetry too early. Because you, know, you notice, especially like in this image, there's a big intentional thing here to not make it symmetrical. You can see there's a, root, you know, a series of lines that kind of go up through here and will follow throughout the character. That's because you don't want it to just feel, you know, like it's a, uh, a Rorschach painting of, of roots and vines. It's using clay buildup. This is where you just get to have fun with this kind of stuff, too. I do like to mask stuff a lot and use the move tools. And then just, if there's a weird, like you saw on the eyebrow, like there's kind of a weird thing there, just kind of sculpt it out. tree stump thing going on. One thing I do use a lot also is the replay last feature. I know it's a really old feature, but it's really good. So I always set that to a hotkey. And that's like my BFG brush. That's like number seven, right? That one's late in the game, but I'll it's still really good. So all that does is if I move and I hit seven, it'll do that same thing again, but it also works really good for scaling things. So this eyeball that I'm going to add was too big, so I could scale it down just a little bit, and I could just hit that a few times, and then all of a sudden it's, you know, it's the right size. He's looking a little too lanky-necked for me. This is like the brother Groot never talked about.
Another thing that's really nice about clay buildup, especially with, uh, with this kind of character or really organic characters like this, is I don't have to smooth out and you know, worry about any of the texture that the brush gives. It's actually like a huge advantage. So I'm just going to try to get a general idea of kind of where this is all going. And then we'll get into kind of switching it up a little bit. So I don't want it to look too humanoid in the neck. It's okay to have that a little bit, but just kind of maybe break it up. So this kind of comes through here. And then maybe we'll put some plates, like a wooden plate on his chest. So I'm going to use the same technique I showed you on the Silver Surfer thing. I'm going to duplicate the whole thing. I'm going to go to deformation, inflate, negative, and just say two. So now if you see, if I have a transparency on, it's like right inside. Like right inside. There's just a little thin, little thin marker for that. But now I can use, you know, snake hook brush or anything like that to really pull some stuff out. Where are you? It's like a million brushes in here. Maybe subdivide that. That's already subdivided. Kind of use that as part of the design, even though it's a little chunky. It's okay. I don't need to spend a lot of time and energy trying to you know, subdivide something when it's not necessary. Go through with the trim dynamic brush. Since these are going to be a little bit of a different texture, just to kind of planer it up. And then I'll just use the move brushes and stuff like that to kind of just pull it through. This is like a little tree stump up here. Now, if, if something is getting in the way, if I don't like, like I pulled this out and I wanted to carve into it, but then all of a sudden that mesh Underneath it is there, because that was the initial one I duplicated. I'll just quickly alt-click the underneath one, and I'll just sculpt that out of the way. So that's why you see on some of my, you know, the Surfer ones, why they were really, really messed up when you just showed one of them. is because I don't really have much regard for the geometry that's there. It doesn't matter to me which, which part of the sculpture is coming through, because eventually it's all going to be one piece or it's it's all going to be the same thing so even if like that doesn't necessarily go with what I was expecting but it's also like maybe that's moss or it's something that's kind of sitting on top and it can be a little textural detail or it's a rock you know there's plenty of other things that could be So this one, maybe that one will have like a bigger piece and it'll be like on the shoulder. I got a Twitter question for mm -hmm. you. Once you saw the concept for him, are there any tips for analyzing the concept art before start 
sculpting in ZBrush. So what's your transition going from the concept art to the ZBrush model? To ZBrush? Yeah. Um, well, just to clarify, there wasn't concept art for group, if that was part of the question. Yeah. Okay. There was no concept art. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was no concept art for group. Um, what you saw was concept art. So in essence, you were using ZBrush to create the concept. Yeah. Uh, for other things that I do use ZBrush for, like for Iron Man stuff or whatever, to block out proportions, um, I spend a lot of time evaluating, uh, and I actually talk about this a lot in, in one of the courses that I had, evaluating concepts, part of what that is, you know? Uh, so if, you're, if your job is to model something and your job is specifically to model a concept, um, and you don't have a model or anything to start from, you have to really kind of get in there and understand like what, what, in, what things was the concept artist who made the painting thinking about? Like were they intentional? Um, so flow lines and rhythms and uh, all these things that can be subtle things of a character, like they were probably thinking about those when they were putting it into the image. And if you just quickly are getting into the, the art just wanting to you know, bang out a sculpt, you know, of something that kind of looks like that, it's not going to be totally you know, the essence of what they were going for. So spend a little bit more time looking at the concept art. It's okay to spend five minutes, ten minutes just staring at an image. It's not going to be a huge waste in your day, uh, especially if you're going to be spending the next two weeks or a month trying to make a character, right? It's okay. You can take a few minutes and really evaluate what's going on in, in the concept. So his face here is kind of just, the underlying face is kind of getting in the way. So what I'll do is I'll hit solo mode and I'll just go crazy on it. Like, just get it out of the way. Don't have to deal with it anymore. We got a question here live on the flow. Mm -hmm. When the concept mesh was, or the underlying mesh was getting in the way, I noticed you just kind of mashed it back as opposed to it. <laughs> just give it a little bit of texture before we move on. Just running across the surface of it real fast. Kind of some wood greeny kind of stuff with the clay build up. And then going over that with the, the uh, dam standard. Another question here from the floor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, when you're creating a character, where do you start? Like, do you start with the head or do you start with the torso or the leg? Because um, when I draw, I start with the eye, but recently I've been starting with the torso, and I just leave the head for last. Um, I almost always start with the head uh, for two reasons. First off, you saw, like, this is just the head, right? Or it's a bust shot. But most of the time, directors, producers, whoever you're giving it to, that's what they're going to care about. That's the stuff that's going to be on marketing. That's the thing that's going to be... You know, the iconic part of the design that they're going to turn toys into, like masks, Halloween stuff. That's what they're going to care about the most. So I almost always start with the head. And then I'll move on to the body and, you know, go on from there. Now, that is contrary to what I said with my Silver Surfer thing, where I just started with the body. And I had no idea what I wanted to do with the head. But um, especially when somebody's paying me, I'm going to start with the head. When it's silver, like the silver surfer stuff is, you know, it's kind of fan art and um, you know, it's for myself more than anybody else. He has like a big mole here, tree mole. All right, so now that I've got these meshes all kind of doing what I want, 
Uh, I'll go in and just use the, the, the curve brush. So what, one of the things with the curve brush, and I'll just show you real quick, I'll actually use the curve tube brush, is if you start drawing on, it's going to be like, oh, you have subdivisions. Basically what I do, you can probably see a recurring theme in my workflow. I'm going to duplicate this whole thing, and I'm just going to delete those subdivisions. So now I have three things that are kind of in the same space, but I can draw those curves onto them. Now if I want to even make it like, I don't actually mind it going into the surface because I know it's going like into the head right now, but that's okay because this character is going to have vines like going into his head, so it's not a big deal. So draw out a curve, I'll grab the move brush, um, and I'll just kind of start moving things around. Maybe this is like a little one that will go in here. And it'll peek through, like down here. Just delete the curve. I know you can pull it around, but because I'm warping it so badly and I don't really care about it being uh, on the, the surface, I'm not, cons not really considering that at all. Now maybe I want something bigger. It'll go through here. Cool. Delete the curve. Chuck that in here. Cool. And re really, it's just kind of a, a little bit of a rinse and repeat situation for a while. If I need it to be bigger, just resize and reselect the curve. Push it in. You can maybe you can also go back to while you're in this kind of placing mode and start sculpting in things. It's like, oh, I like that this is kind of sitting over this. Yeah, maybe it, there's a little notch in the wood. And this will kind of get in the way of that. Or maybe we'll, we'll add like a really big one for his neck. Too big. Good enough. All right. No. We are Groot. Um, no. Let's see. I can't rotate anymore, which is good. I think I'm stuck like in the curve mode. Hmm? All oh, right. Thomas, you want to jump on his back again? <laughs> I can still move this. Oh, did it? Do you want me to hop up? Oh, I see. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Why did when I touched it, did it stop working? 
Let's try it again. What is, are you right clicking? Yeah. Uh, it's not seeing this. The single click? Like, what do you think of redesigning versus like fan art, or how far do you need to redesign something how before? Far? Like, what's legally? It's twenty percent, if that's yeah. the question. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, just like versus doing something completely original or redesigning something. Mm -hmm. What's sort of like the different thing you show when you put that in a portfolio piece, or mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? I think there's. Are you saying like? When it becomes like, is it how, when it becomes yours, or yeah, when it just, becomes impressive to an employer, or yeah, something like that. Like versus okay. doing straight up fan art. Sure, uh, I know, think fan art, regardless, if you like doing it. Um, first off, it's usually fun, right? Uh, second, um, it's already got a big fan base. When you do your things for yourself, to have your own IPs or your own ideas, nobody knows what they are. Um, and most of the time, unless they're not like really, really cool, I think that's me, by the way, making that sound. Um, nobody's going to care initially. So, but people, employers, regardless, are going to respect an impressive looking piece. Uh, so if it's impressive personal piece versus impressive fan art, it's probably toss up in the air. Um, but the kind of benefit of always of doing fan art is that you've got the whole other world who knows what it is, right? So you see a lot of other people get, you know, uh, a little bit of recognition or they get, they get their personal work looked at because they did fan art. Does that make sense? Um, as far as redesigning versus just doing pure fan art, like making a, you know, whatever, doing, if I would have done Silver Surfer exactly like he looked like in the comics versus trying to redesign him, uh, I would always take the challenge to redesign. Uh, more because it's a challenge, unless you're doing a study. If you just want to do a study and, and have some fun with that, then that's totally valid. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, thank you. Good. We'll take one from Twitter right here. Cool. Bella is asking, I know the topic was touched now, but still, do you think concepting only in ZBrush without 2D can become common practice? I think it is common practice. I think it's definitely getting there. Um, but I think t 2D definitely has a place. Um, 3D is really good. It's got a lot of benefits to it. Number one is speed. Number two is you can hand it down the pipeline, which is also in tune with speed because it's not just your speed. It's the speed of the overall production. Um, when you're doing stuff you know, on a, a big movie, Everybody wants their stuff now, right? So that's where 3D really comes into, tune, into play. Uh, when it comes to pure design, I think that 2D is definitely the better place to start. Uh, if you have the skills there, you know, if you draw like me and you draw like stick figures, then don't start in 2D. But, you know, if you have the skills to start in 3D, it's so much faster. Uh, 
excuse me, if you have the skills in 2D, it's so much faster, especially if you want to do something that's like a cast of characters, right? Um, so for example, I have an idea that I'm working on for myself. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but just hypothetically, um, it has four main characters. And they all are a little bit different, and they all have different sizes and shapes and, and all that kind of stuff. In order to do that in 3D, I have to go through the whole process of, of essentially sculpting almost an entire character, right? Before I get into doing the other characters, unless I'm doing like kind of like a fourth of a character all the way across. Um, and that can really hamper the, you know, the process and making it look cohesive. So if you look at the guys from, from uh, Valve for Team Fortress, you know, that's a big thing that went around. But they all designed it so that when you looked at the crew, they looked like a cast, they looked like a crew. It wasn't like, this guy's badass, this guy's badass, and they don't look anything like each other and they don't fit in the same world. Um, so you gotta be, you know, you gotta pay 2D, it's, it's definite, it's due. Because it's still a super powerful and still probably one of the best for doing thumbnails and quick things for getting out ideas. All right, where were we at? Curves. All right. All right, we'll just add in a few more of these bigger ones. Uh, one thing I really like, by the way, about inflate, the inflate brush. This is probably intentional, but I didn't know it until I actually experimented, experimented with it myself, is if you inflate something, when it, it just kind of inflates it. But if you have the brush setting at the full size, it inflates the whole object, even if you're not on the whole object. Yes, that was intentional. See? <laughs> That's a feature. Straight from the source. Um, well, I like that feature. So, because I don't have to go down to here all the time and, and go, oh, inflate by 20 and hope that's the number I wanted. But this way I can just, you know, gauge it. Just maybe a few small ones. Delete. Delete. Hold on, I gotta go to Utah for this question. One second. All the way to the back. Good luck buying beer there, by the way. All right. Oh, no. Here we go. Here's a question from the back. Hello. Uh, touching back on your last question, there was a debate I had with a friend who was a 2D concept artist, mm -hmm. and he was asking me several times, should I bother going to 3D to get into concept and still be viable? And, and something I was wondering with him, and I was wondering what your take is on it, with where ZBrush is going these days and mm -hmm. 3D technology and sketching in it, um, does it still pay your dues to spend time becoming an amazing render artist or an amazing painter or sure. just drawing? If, you, if ultimately concept is your interest, could you go the route of doing just 3D and still be viable in the market? Viable as in a market? Yes, viable. I mean, this is all personal stuff, right? So we can get real deep on this. Um, Viable, and this is going to be purely my opinions, um, viable as a market, viable as somebody you know who can present things to clients. If you're really looking at yourself as you are a, a person who provides things to a client, yeah, you can definitely do that. But I think that you know, maybe not becoming you know, an excellent render artist and knowing reflections like off the back of your hand how they're going to look through a water bottle, like, and being able to draw that is not important probably as it used to be. Um, my tablet can't really sculpt anymore, I don't think anymore. Oh, good thing I said that, because now it's working. Um, yeah. So anyways, that's a very, you know, touchy subject, I think, for a lot of people, because that becomes what is an artist, who is an artist, is 3D an artist? For a long time, people weren't considering 3D an art, so is it? Well, now it is. Well, what about photo bashing? What about art bashing? And then that's where you get into like, what is viable, what is not viable. I think rendering in 2D is still viable. I'm just gonna put that out though. I also like paintings though. I still think painting in oil is viable. So, yeah. 
So what I could do once I've got all of these, I got all these tubes and they're all attached to this body. So what I do is I turn on frame. You can see they're all different colors. Go to poly groups, control shift click, make sure this one is grouped, invert that. I'm going to group this. So now there are two different uh, poly groups within one subtool. And I'll go to split, group split. Now this one, which is exactly the same as this one, but one of them has subdivisions. So I'm going to delete the one with subdivision or without subdivisions. And now I've got this beautiful subtool with just all these little roots on it. So I can subdivide these up to as much as I want. And I can start sculpting these in as well. Here's a good question from Brandy. How, does, how do you decompress or relieve stress from deadlines and life outside of sculpting and art? Mm -hmm. I play a lot of games. Uh, escapism, that's my kind of, you know, there's different kinds of people's, you know, cool downs, decompression, relax, whatever. I'm an escapism person. I like movies. I like games. I like books. I like board games, you know, going into to other worlds, not cosplay, D&D, &D, so we're about on the same level. Um, you know, I like everything nerdy, so it's like, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go live in Rivendale for a while and you guys can deal with your deadline. Here's an interesting question from Greg for you with Groot. Uh, so do the production modelers and texture artists get your work? Yes. To start from or are they just getting your concept for reference? So you uh, all, actually give them the files. Yeah, sure. Um, all of the models that I do, or all the concepts that I do, do you know, they're all based off of a sculpt. So even if this is as far as I took the model, or you know, even as this is as far as I took this, they're getting this and the painting. So they get a good reference. You know, they have a good idea of what it is. I don't take credit for what the characters look like on screen. I'm not an idiot, right? Um, you know, I know that there's hundreds of, and hundreds of thousands of man hours after I get done with a character that it gets, it gets handled with. Um, so for characters like Iron Man and, and Groot and all those guys, huge props because they made the character look awesome and they made it look like I was hoping it would look. Uh, but yeah, they all, they will all get a model and they will, they will get the concept as well. Louis going to jump up, the, up there with him in a minute. So if someone's got a question here, now's the mm -hmm. time. Okay, don't ever ask me ever again, Nano. <laughs> How long does it take you to finish a character like Groot in production, Tan asks? In production? Um, I would say that, like... How much time did they give you, actually? <laughs> Go there. <laughs> um, <laughs> It takes about, like I try to do, if we're doing concepts, I try to do at least two a week because I want to, I don't present like half things. Like I only present things that are at least, like I don't do sketches. It's like this or nothing. So it's like there's full or nothing. So I'm going to spend like two, you know, two days on something to try to make it really nice. So yeah. But to do the whole character, he kind of worked like my Silver Surfer project, which is why they work really well together, um, where it started with one design and it just kind of evolved through that. So it's not, it's hard to say like how long it took because the design process was really long. But again, we went down, no pun intended, all these branches of like, this is the final design, but we're going to try all these other things. So this is my you know, kind of random workflow of kit bashing meshes together. Um, but I think it works pretty well. It works for me at least, and I think that's probably the more important thing for me. Very animated brow. So 
So what, the one you worked on, you didn't have to worry about rigging and animators because you were handing it off to this other studio to do all the rigging and animating, correct? Correct. Yeah, I don't, uh, fortunately, working in, you know, again, pre-production, I don't have to deal with a lot of the post stuff. And our studio is very unique where, again, we have one art department that goes over all the movies. Uh, but also all of our movies are big movies. So they get broken up into a lot of, of visual effects houses. So my job is essentially to create a model or a, a concept that has a model that can be used as a bar for all the visual effects houses we give it to. So they'll get the model. It should look like this. If you need to retop it, if you need to do whatever you got to do to make it work in your pipeline, go for it. Like, but this is basically the bar of what it should look like. Fabulous. Well, Josh, it's, Josh is all right with you. We're going to put Louie up on the stage. Oh, all right. Now. Let's do it. Are you ready for it? Everybody, Josh Herman. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>